Hello. Today we are going to carry on with our using resources topic and we're going to be thinking about some new materials. We're going to think about glass and ceramics and composites. So this belongs in unit 10, the using resources topic, and it's a separate chemistry only topic. So using resources, so far we've thought about water, about metals and alloys, and about polymers, particularly HDPE and LDPE, and the thermo and thermo, thermo setting and thermo softening polymers. Today we're going to meet three new materials, ceramics, glass and composites. So ceramics, when you hear ceramics you probably think pottery, but in chemistry terms we mean much more than that. Bricks and clays are ceramics, so ceramic objects include bricks, tiles, crockery, bathroom sinks, baths and toilets. Have a think at home, have a look around you, what can you spot in your house that might be made of ceramics? Um, this diagram, I'm going to jump over the other side of the screen, this diagram here um, is a, a kind of simplified bonding diagram of uh, clay, the structure of clay ceramics. So have a look at that diagram and I want you to think about what you already know about structure and bonding. So you've seen some diagrams like that, what does it look like, what are the dots, what are the lines? So using your knowledge of structure and bonding, I want you to predict the answer to these questions. What type of structure is it? What will its melting point be? Why? What, will it be able to conduct electricity? Yes or no, and why? So I want you to pause now and write down your answers. Right, how did you get on then? So question one, what type of structure? It's a giant covalent structure. Remember these lines like we drew with graphite and diamond? So it's giant covalent structure. If there's a giant covalent structure, like diamond, like graphite, it's gonna have a really high melting point. Why? Because it's got loads of covalent bonds. So to overcome these bonds, all of these black lines, those pairs of electrons, that's gonna need a lot of energy. Will it be able to conduct electricity? No, nope, because there are no free ions or electrons there that could move around and carry a charge. Um, no, this is a simplified diagram. Um, clay is actually uh, contains lots of different things. You've got compounds of metals, things with aluminium, potassium, non-metals, your silicon and your oxygen. Um, so there is covalent bonding between the non-metal atoms, but there's also some ionic bonding going on between the metals and the non-metals. But this diagram is sufficient for GCSE. Um, oh, I'm going to jump over the other side. Uh, right, so thinking about clay then, in terms of properties, it's a funny one because it's malleable when you start with it, but then it becomes brittle. So the particles form giant structures which are arranged in layers. Remember graphite's a bit like that. Water molecules can get in between those layers, so when it is wet it can make the clay slippery and slimy. So I don't know if you've ever done any clay work or seen, you must have seen somebody with a potter's wheel, you can see that damp clay that's soft and slimy. When you put the clay in the furnace though, the water that's in between those layers gets removed and then you end up with bonds forming between the layers and those bonds are strong and give it a totally different properties. It then becomes a really rigid, brittle structure. Um, and then you can do lots of with ceramics by controlling the temperature of your kiln and the higher the temperature of the kiln, the harder the ceramics going to be. Right, think about glass then. So again, we use the word glass every day, but actually in chemistry terms, there's lots of different things we mean by glass. In general terms, glass is mainly made from sand, so in a chemical sense, it's mainly made of silicon dioxide. You put that into a furnace and you heat it up and then you can mould it or roll it or blow it into shape. Um, you can add other stuff in there, which will make different types of glass. And by controlling either the temperature of your furnace or the rate of cooling, you can change the properties of your glass. So like we had the diagram before, this is a generalised diagram of the bonding in glass. Same as before, I want you to think about structure and bonding and have a go at answering the questions. So pause the video here, jot down your answers. How do we get on? So again, it's a giant covalent structure. It's going to have a high melting and boiling point because you've got loads of covalent bonds. So it's going to need a lot of energy to break all of those bonds. Will it be able to conduct electricity? Again, no, because there are no free ions or electrons. So we said that there are actually different kinds of glass. There's two that you need to be aware of for the GCSE. So first one is called soda lime glass. That's the most common form of glass. So things when you, you know, go and get a glass of water at home, you put it in a glass, it's gonna be soda lime glass. Um, to make soda lime glass, we need sand, which is our silicon dioxide, sodium carbonate and limestone. Limestone is mainly calcium carbonate. So we put those in a furnace and melt it down. 
The other type of glass you need to be aware of is borosilicate glass. Now, borosilicate glass is quite useful because it melts at a much higher temperature than soda lime glass. So again, the basic component is sand, the silicon dioxide, but we add to it boron trioxide. A bit of a scary word there, but tri, remember it's three, so it's three oxygens joined onto our boron. Um, when we have glassware in school, our test tubes, our boiling tubes, those are all made from borosilicate. If you tried to put one of your drinking glasses into a Bunsen burner flame, it would just shatter. Uh, you might have come across Pyrex. I can jump down here. Here's a classic Pyrex jug. Um, that's a, actually a brand name, but it's become synonymous with glassware that you might have at home that you can just pop in the oven. So um, borosilicate glass is our glass that can go to a high, much higher temperature. Uh, recycling glass is something that uh, we're going to th think about with our using resources topic, how we make best use of our resources. And recycling of glass is a bit more straightforward than plastic, so it's actually done quite widely. And it's becoming increasingly important, and recycled glass now makes up about 30% of glass mixtures. Right, last new type of material is composites. So composites are materials that we're designing for a particular use, that are made from two materials to produce a product with improved properties. So it usually includes a matrix or binder of one material, which surrounds and binds together fabrics or fibers or fabrics, sorry, fibers or fragments of another material. And that process is called reinforcement. So this is a really big area of development for material science, and there's loads of so many combinations we can do of what materials we choose, what proportions we put them in, and that idea of design of materials is something that's really, really growing at the moment. Um, obviously, composites vary, so you're not expected to know the structure of things like we looked at those diagrams before. You should know some examples and, and an idea of what's in them. So first up, an example is a glass ceramic composite. So glass and ceramics are both hard but brittle. But if you actually heat a ceramic and glass together, you can make a composite, which is hard but also really tough. Um, it isn't brittle in the same way because as the glass melts when you heat it, it goes in between the crystalline structure of the ceramic. And it means that if you then get a crack, it can't spread through because the glass is in there to hold it together. Another example, probably one you're more familiar with, is our polymer glass composites. So fiberglass is an example where we've got polymers and ceramics joined up together. So you have glass fibers as your matrix, and then you surround that with a binder of a polymer resin. You can then mold it into shape and it hardens, and that produces something that's tough and flexible and waterproof, um, and it's also got a low density. That makes it useful for things like kayaks, boats, um, and we're part of the development in this area is looking at the use of carbon fibers. So we're looking at carbon fibers or ca carbon nanotubes that we could put in instead of glass fibers, which would create a structure very similar to fiberglass. But because those carbon nanotubes can conduct electricity, that would give you a whole different set of things you could do with it. Uh, another area is a metal concrete composite. So reinforced concrete, you might have come across that as a term. Ooh, jump over this side. Um, here you can see we have our steel rods, that's our matrix, and our binder is the concrete that's poured around it. Concrete itself is a, a composite. It's made of cement, cement and sand and gravel and water. So the cement binds together that matrix of sand and gravel. So we pour that all over here and then when it sets you've got concrete with steel inside it. And that makes a really strong material that's resistant to compression. So when you're trying to big, big, when you're trying to build really big structures, that is uh, really good for making it strong and it can take that compression. Uh, final area is wood polymer composites. So you've hopefully come across the term MDF. MDF stands for medium density fiberboard. So as an example, you get wood chips and shavings or sawdust, some bits of wood, and you can press them together, and that's your matrix. And then around that, you add in your polymer resin, and that's the binder that holds it all together. So MDF is really useful because you've got something that behaves like wood, you can paint it like wood, but actually you can cut it into all sorts of intricate shapes and it won't splinter. You don't have to worry about the grain of the wood or anything like that. It can uh, have really intricate gaps there. Oh. Right, so I'm there. So here's all the different materials we have looked at in this area of the using resources topic. We thought about water, about metals and alloys, composites, polymers, glass, and ceramics. 
So the expectation is that you are aware of all these different materials, you've got an idea of what they're formed of, what their properties are. Um, quite often though, exam questions in this area are really application based. So you might get a material you've never heard of and you'll be thinking, oh, how is that like glass? How is that like wet or trying to link their understanding of properties? It's also quite often um, application in terms of here's some data about different materials. What can you conclude from this data?